It was narrated by Ibn Taymiyyah, an Islamic scholar, Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him, he said, Inna al-nasa lam yatanaza'u fi anna aqibata dhulmi wa khima, wa aqibata al-adli karima, wa lihada yudwa, Allahu yansu al-dawla al-adila, wa in kanat kafira, wa la yansu al-dawla al-dhalima, wa in kanat mu'mina. Ibn Taymiyyah says, that there is no dispute at all, You are just, your end result will be fine, will be blissful, you will be happy in the end. But if you are oppressive, your end result will be pernicious. So you may get away with your oppression for some time, but time will come when you will not be able to evade the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he continues, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give victory, will give success to a country that observes justice even if the rulers are not Muslims. If they observe justice to everyone, even if the rulers are not Muslims, the majority of the inhabitants of that, of that country are not Muslims, Allah will give them victory. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will render them fail those who do not observe justice even if they are Muslims. So the issue is not whether you are a Muslim or not. You have to observe justice if you want to be successful in whatever you do. Now, this does not only apply on countries, on rulers, presidents, kings. It cuts across the board. If you are a CEO in your company, you have to observe justice. If you are a husband at home, you have more than one wife, you have to observe justice. You have to be fair to your children, so you should not under any circumstances favor anyone at the detriment of another person. So in all in your capacity, if you observe justice, if you observe equality, you will be successful in whatever you do. 
So it cuts across the board. If you are two people and you are responsible for the other person, you have to treat him fairly if you want to be successful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 16, verse number 19, Inna Allah yamur bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkar wal baghi ya'ibukum la'allakum tadakkarun. Allah commands justice, the doing of good, and giving to kith and king, and forbids all indecent deeds, evil and oppression. Allah instructs you that you may receive admonition. So if you want to be successful, you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love you, you have to be just. And you have to do what's called al-ihsan. Al-ihsan has got many, many connotations. But here, I will concentrate on three. The first one is, an to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him. And if you don't see him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you wheresoever you may be. And the second one is to do good deeds where they are not strictly recommended or where they are not strictly demanded from you. You choose to do good. There are many examples. And the third one is an example that was given by Sheikh Sha'rawi that Al-Ihsan is to do more than what you are required to do. As a Muslim, for example, we have to pray five times a day. So if you want to observe Ihsan, after praying five obligatory prayers, you wake up at night, you pray the Hajjul, you pray other optional prayers, this is Al-Ihsan. So, brothers and sisters in Islam, we have to observe justice and al-ihsan. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our role model in each and everything that we do, was the best example in justice. During his time, a woman was caught right-handed stealing. And because she came from what was so-called a noble family according to their standards, I don't know whether they were according to Islamic standards, but they claimed they came from a noble family, Bani Mahzum. So they want to hush up the issue. They didn't want people to know about it because their fame would be tarnished. So they looked for all avenues to make sure that they hush up the issue that a woman from their tribe stole. So they sent Usama bin Zayn and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved Usama dearly. Usama was beloved to him. So they wanted to make use of Usama to come and intercede on, on their behalf with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Usama came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to not punish the woman and to make it a secret. What did Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned it to hell. He punished those who came before you. And one of the reasons was because whenever a strong person, a rich person, stole some money, some, ble some belongings, he would go scot-free. He would get away with it. But when a poor person, a weak person stole, then they would punish that person. So why favor some other people on the detriment of other people? So some people would say, if someone is strong and rich, how can he steal? There is something called kleptomania. When someone in his mind, he feels he likes to steal and there is nothing that he can do about it. It's a congenital behavior. Whether he's able or not, he just wants to steal. And today we hear of billionaires cheating, engaged in graft, uh, money laundering, and sometimes they get away with it because they're strong financially. And the poor person who steals uh, $20 or 100 is the one who is punished. So why double standards? So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, those people who came before you were punished and condemned to hell because they used to punish the poor and leave the rich and the strong. So if you want to really improve yourself and do justice, you have to do justice without fear or favor. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued. He says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَوْ أَنَّ فَاطِمَةَ بِنْتِ مُحَمَّدِ السَّرَقَةِ لَقَطَعَتْ يَدَهَا I swear by Allah, in whose heart is my soul, if my daughter Fatima steals, I will cut off, I will 
chop off her hand. So Prophet Muhammad says, even his own daughter, Fatma, the one he loved the most, if she steals and it's proven, he will cut off her hand. That is justice. So if we implement that, we'll be successful in whatever we do. <laughs> his companions, there are a lot of examples. Just I will give a few examples about how Prophet Muhammad وسلم, his companions and those who came after them were keen to implement justice. Ali ibn Abi Talib when he was caliph, leader of believers, in today's presence we can say when he was president of the Muslim world, during that time they did not have geographical boundaries. All Muslims were together as one country, whether they were in Asia, Africa, Europe, they were all regarded as one country under one khalifa. So during the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, a Jew came to, uh, to a judge called Shuraik. In today's presence, we can say an attorney general called Shuraik. So the Jew complained to Shuraik that Ali stole his coat of mail. You know, in their primitive time, they used to manufacture conventional primitive weapons like spears, bows and arrows, and shields to protect them. And the shields had many types. So this Jew came to Ali ibn Abi Talib, came to Shuraik, claiming that Ali stole his coat of mail. So Shuraih summoned Ali, and Ali was sitting in the bench as, um, as someone who has been accused, as a defendant. So the Jew was surprised how this happened. Ali is the leader of believers, and Shuraih is just a mere judge. How can the judge have power to summon a leader to come and sit at the benches and to listen to, his, to the court proceedings? So Ali, uh, Shuraih asked Ali, do you have any evidence that this coat of mail belongs to you? Do you have any witnesses? Ali said, no, I don't have any witness. The Jew brought some witnesses and they gave witness that the Jew, uh, that, that coat of mail belonged to him. So uh, Shuraih judged that the Jew was the owner of the coat of mail, of the shield. Did Ali complain? Did Ali use his power as the caliph of Muslims in order to play down the, to play down the judgment of the attorney general? He didn't do that. He accepted. And the Jew, when he was, he was amazed, he was surprised how justice happened in this part of the world. So he came to Ali and Shuray and said, actually, the court of men belongs to you. I was, I was lying. Then Ali told him, you just keep it. Now, did the attitude of Ali change about that Jew? No. Did he change the way he was treating him? No. Yet he had the powers to do whatever he wanted because they were obliging to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, verse number 58, Justice is justice, has to be done across the board, whether you favor those people, whether they, whether they are dear to you, if they are criminals, you have to punish them. So don't favor anyone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not let the hatred of people towards you or your aversion towards people solve you from doing justice. Do it be just, that's nearest to piety. And fear Allah, for Allah hears and sees each and everything. So, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his companions observed this verse. They knew that they had to do justice. Whether you like that person or you hate that person, when he is right, you have to tell he is right. When he does something good, you have to reward him. And when he deserves punishment, you have to punish him. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in a hadith that was narrated by Buraida, and Buraida radiallahu anhu qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-qullatu thalatha, wahidun fil jannah, wa thnani fil nar, fa amma alladhi fil jannah, fa rajun arafa 
In the hadith that was narrated by Buraw, by Buraida, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, there are three categories of judges. Now, this does not necessarily mean that judges in the courthouse, no. Anywhere, if you are in position to judge between two people, you may be at home, your children come to complain to you, and you need to judge between them, you need to be an arbiter between them, then you have to observe justice. If you have more than one wife, and there are complaints against each other, so you have to be a judge. If you are a manager at work, and your employees come to complain, you are the judge in that capacity. So it does not necessarily mean a judge in the courthouse, it means wherever you may be, when you judge between people, you have to observe fairness and justice. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu says, judges or arbiters as we, as if you will, they are divided into three categories. One category will go to paradise and the two will go to hellfire. The one that will go to paradise is a person who realizes the truth, who after a cross-examining a lot of evidences comes to the real truth and gives judgment according to the truth and in conformity with the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this judge, this arbiter will go to paradise. Regarding the two, who will go to hellfire? The one who knows the truth, he knows that so and so is innocent. He didn't commit a crime. But because the plaintiff, the complainant is his relative, is his friend, he judges in favor of his friend at the detriment of the other person. He will go to hell and the person who judges, who judges out of ignorance. So brothers and sisters, Islam does not condone ignorance. Islam does not condone, does not uh, cherish ignorance at all. If you commit a crime under ignorance, you will be punished because we have many ways of getting knowledge. And actually, this explains as to why if you are in high position, you have to give positions and posts to people who deserve them. Because if you don't do that, people will mistreat other people and you will be responsible for that. And you will be questioned about that on the day of judgment. So, you have to be competent and you don't have to favor anyone when you are in place to judge between two or more than two people. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, Arsalani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ila al-Yamani qadiya faqult, Ya Rasulullah, atumsiluni wa ana hadithu sinni wa la ilma li bil qadha faqala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna Allah ويثبت لسانك فإذا جلس بين يديك اثنان فلا تقضي حتى تسمع من الآخر كما سمعت من الأول فإنه أحرى أن يتبين لك القضاء قال علي رضي الله عنه فما زلت قاضيا أو ما شككت في قضاء بعد علي بن أبي طالب said that Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم intended to send him to Yemen as a judge among the people of Yemen so Ali when he was told by the Prophet that he would be sent to Yemen, he was concerned about it. He asked the Prophet, he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, do you want to send me to Yemen? Yet I am still young, I don't have experience in judgeship, I don't know anything about administration of justice. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will firm up your tongue. So if you observe the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't worry, Allah will guide you and he will guide your tongue. You will not have a slip of a tongue at all. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives him instructions. He, te he tells him, when litigants or com people come to you complaining about one another, do not pass any judgment until you listen to both of them. You know, sometimes, because we like someone in many cultures, if you complain first, you're right. So your boss trusts you, your father trusts you, so you come to him to complain about Mr. X because they trust you, so you are right. They don't have time to listen to another person, to another type of story. You come to a person, you tell him, you know, Muhammad does this and that, don't employ him. So before investigating, before asking Muhammad, they pass a judgment. That's wrong. You have to listen to both parties. You have to add to 
first check their evidences, their claims, so that you reach a, a conclusive judgment. Otherwise, you'll be in danger. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advises Ali ibn Abi Talib, when people come to you complaining about one another, listen to them equally. So after you listen, you listen to them, this will facilitate the process of reaching a final and equivocal ju judgment. So if you want to pass a judgment which is not questionable, you have to listen to two parties. And if you do that, no matter whether you have experience in judge in judgeship or you don't, you will be doing the right thing. But a lot of the time, we don't do that for so many reasons. So, brothers and sisters in Islam, it's very important, and as I said earlier, if you don't observe justice, you will not be successful in whatever you do. You may be successful for some time, but your end result will be pernicious. It was narrated by Muhammad ibn Ka'b al-Qawzi, قال, دعاني عمر بن عبد العزيز فقال, صفلي العد, قلت باقي, لقد سألت عن أمر جسيم, كل صغير الناس أبا, ولكبيرهم ابنا, وللمثل منهم أخا, وللنساء كذلك. وعاقب الناس على قدر ذنوبهم وعلى قدر أجسادهم ولا تضربن بغضبك سوطا واحدا متعديا فتكون من العادين رواه ابن أبي حاتم محمد القرض says he was summoned by Omar ibn Abdulaziz Omar ibn Abdulaziz came from the lineage of Omar ibn Khattab and it's a long story so Omar ibn Abdulaziz is a leader during his time there was justice throughout the Muslim world and scholars historians tell us that during the time of Omar ibn Abdulaziz because justice prevailed each and everywhere during his time people would collect zakah the compulsory charity that we pay annually they would collect zakah and look for poor and indigent people to give the zakah they would find none no one was in need of zakah because of the justice that prevailed during that time even some scholars say he is the, the fifth khalifa because of the way he ruled muslims and the way the way he was keen to implement the teachings of muhammad so umar ibn aziz summoned a scholar called muhammad ibn Ka'b. he was concerned about justice he wanted to improve he wanted to do better in terms of justice so he summoned a scholar the scholar was afraid what does the leader need from me so he went and sat down in front of umar ibn Abdul aziz so umar asked him can you explain to me what is justice how can i implement how can i be fair to each and everyone so muhammad ibn Ka'b told him, bravo, well done, excellent. You have asked about a great virtue. You have asked about something great in Islam. So he told him, if you really want to implement justice across the board, you have to treat any person who is younger than you as though he's your own son. If you do that, every person who is younger than you, when he comes to you, when you deal with him, treat him as though you would treat your own son. And when you treat your own son, you will be fair to him. And when you meet an older person, a person who is older than you, treat him as though he was your father. When you meet someone who is older than you, treat him like your father. Because you can't be unfair to your father unless your brain is ruined. But if you have, you are, if you are in good mind, good sense, you will treat your father fairly. So every person that comes to you in the age of your father, you have to treat him as your father. And treat everyone at your age. Someone who is in the same age category as you are, you treat him like your brother. So if you do that, you will have done justice to the people. So he continued, Muhammad continued telling him that if you punish people, you punish them according to their sins. Now sometimes, if you are in position, or you have children, you don't like children, child X, uh, in your heart you feel you don't like him, he commits a small mistake and you vent out your anger on that child. You are a teacher at school, maybe they didn't pay you your salary, and a student makes a small mistake, you capitalize upon it. We've, been, we've heard cases whereby children were punished at school until they died. So this punishment, the children gets a punishment which is not proportional to the, uh, to the mistake that he committed. So we, we should avoid that. And that is Muhammad advising Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. Also, when you punish people, punish them according to their bodies. You cannot punish a child who is five years old uh, like you punish 
someone who is 20 years old. So you have to put into consideration the age and the body and the strength of that person that you are punishing. And then something very important, he said, when you are angry, do not lash anyone. Do not punish anyone. Because when people are angry, they tend to be emotional rather than being rational. And you can't be judged when you are overpowered by your emotions. You have to be rational in order to pass a sound judgment. And of course, this scholar had read the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that was narrated by Abi Bakr. And Abi Bakr radiallahu anhu qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu Prophet Muhammad says, any arbiter, any judge should not judge between two contestants, two antagonists, if he is angry. When you are angry, don't judge. Wait until you cool down, then you can pass a sound judgment. So Muhammad advises Umar ibn Abdul Aziz that when you are angry, don't punish anyone. Don't pass any judgment. Because if you do that, you will have crossed legal lines and you will have encroached upon or infringed upon human rights. And human rights are very, very important in Islam. <coughs> so talking about children, talking about those who are younger than us, treating them as like our own children, in Islam, we have to be fair and square when we deal with our children. A companion of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Bashir, he came to Prophet, first of all he consulted his wife. He said, I would like to give a monetary gift to my son called Nurman. So this person had more than one son, he had a lot of sons, a lot of children. So he wanted to give a gift to one of them. So his wife says that there was something wrong because he has many children. Why does he give a gift to only one child and neglect others? So she told him, I cannot be a witness to this injustice until you go and ask Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Bashir came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, ashhid, ashhid anni nahaltu ibni an nu'mana min mali kada wa kada. I would like you to be a witness that I have given a monetary gift to my son and Nu'man of this and that amount. What was the response of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Afa kullu banika nahalta mithla alladhi nahalta Nu'man? Have you given the same amount to other children like you have given to Nu'man?" Bashir said, "No." Just only no man. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ashhid ala hadha ghayri. Look for another witness. I can't be a witness of injustice at all. I will be a witness of a fair dealing. But injustice, look for somebody else. Then Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, Awala yurdika, awala yasuruka an yakunu laka fil birri sawa. If all your children are all equally obedient, loyal, and dutiful to you, won't you be happy about that? He said, yes, of course I would be happy. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, in as much as you would be happy, if they are all uh, equi equally dutiful to you, so when you reward them, reward them equally. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi told him, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَعَدِلُوا بَيْنَ أَوْلَادِكُمْ Fear Allah and be fair to all your children. Children. So we have to be fair to our children. Now here comes a catch. Some people sometimes when they talk about fairness, they say if you have two children or you have two wives, if you give one and you give an apple to one, another one you should as well give an apple. I would like to say that equality does not necessarily mean uniformity. Equality does not necessarily mean uniformity, which means you have two children, yes. Some of them would like, uh, one of them would like apples, another one would like bananas. So if you give both of them apples, another one won't be interested. So you will have to do your research, do what each and everyone likes, give, set a budget, like of 50 KD for each, and let each one of them choose whatever you, he wants. And if you feel that they need guidance in choosing whatever they want, give them that guidance. So do not say, okay, because we have to be equal, so I will give them the same. Yes, it may be effective to one, but another one wouldn't like it. Equally, if you are a manager, you are a director in your company, you want to motivate your employees, you want to give them gifts, you don't have to give them gifts across the 
on each and everything, uniform gifts, like, okay, uh, certificates of appreciation to each and everyone. Do your research, do your research to know who likes what and give each and everyone what he treasures most. So this will be effective to you. Because sometimes when we attend courses about management, people complain, you see, I always give, give gifts to my employees, but they don't improve, they're still busy. The reason is he doesn't do research on what each and everybody treasures. Because for him, he thinks because he likes plaques, everyone would like a plaque. Some people don't like plaques. Some people, they like cash. Some people like certificates. Everyone has what he likes. So if you are in position and you want to reward your employees, do a research on which, what everyone treasures the most and give everyone whatever he likes, then they will be motivated and they will be happy. But you don't give them the same thing across the board. Likewise, when we talk about equality, sometimes when you have two children, one of them works harder than the other. One of them is uh, affiliated to, loves you more than the other. One of them is more loyal to you than the other. So in your heart, you are inclined to that one more than the other person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not, does not help hold us responsible for our heartfelt inclinations. And I will explain that in a minute. He does not hold us responsible for our heartfelt inclinations. What we are responsible for is justice in material things. If you buy a car to uh, child B, you have to buy to your child, uh, your son C. But in your heart, if you feel that you are more inclined to Muhammad than Ibrahim, you are not questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. Although you should try hard to love them equally, but love is something that we don't control and I will explain it in a minute. There was an Islamic studies scholar or teacher who was teaching youth about equality and justice in Islam. So while he was teaching them, they found out that he was concentrating on one boy. So his rapt attention was focused on one boy and he did not care about the others. He would come to him, make sure he understood and follow up with him more than he did with other students. So the students were angry. They, they had to ask him the same. You are the one teaching us to be equal with each other. Why are you not fair to us? We see that your attention is geared towards one student and you are not giving us all the same attention. So he just wanted to do something. To teach them a lesson, not verbally, practically, one of the, uh, is one of the Western psychologists called uh, Stephen, Stephen Covey, he wrote a book about the eighth habit, seek to understand and to be understood. And in this book he says, you have to dramatize your ideas. So for example, if you encourage someone to do something, every time you talk, you are tired of talking, you have to dramatize them. How do you dramatize them? It's the same thing that this teacher did. He took all of them out of the classroom, he gave each and every one a bird and a knife. He told them, I want each one of you to slaughter the bird in his arm in a place where no one will see him. Make sure you go to a place where no one will see what you are doing. So all of them went and slaughtered the birds and came back and said, we have done the job, we've slaughtered the birds in a place where no one saw us. Except one, he didn't slaughter. And that's the child whom he used to concentrate on. So when he asked the boy, why didn't you slaughter? He said, sir, I didn't find anywhere where no one can see me because you usually teach us that Allah sees us in every place where we are. Wheresoever we may be, Allah will see us. So he told the other children that this is why I concentrate on him, because he is pious. <coughs> and this is not something new. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once he took some things from a Jew, from a Jew trader. He bought some things, he didn't have cash, and he had to pay after some time. On credit, he took the, uh, the commodities. So after some time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam paid the cash, paid the Jew. He cleared the debt. But he was surprised while he was walking one day with one of his companions called Khuzayma, the Jew appeared and said, Prophet Muhammad, you owe me some money. Prophet Muhammad was surprised. Which money do I owe you? I have already paid you the commodities that I took from you. I paid. Then the Jew asked, do you have any witness? 
the Prophet didn't have a witness because the transaction was done between the Prophet and the Jew. No one else was there. Now, Huzayma, companion of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he saw that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in a fix, he said, I am a witness. Huzayma said, told the Jew that he was a witness when the Prophet paid back the money. But the Prophet was surprised that Huzayma wasn't there. How can he claim now that he was there when the Prophet paid the money? So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa kept quiet. When the Jew left the place, the Prophet asked Huzayma, what's wrong with you? When I paid the money, you were not there. How could you say that you are my witness, yet you were not there? Huzayma said, Ya Rasulullah, usaddiquka fi khabar sama, fa kaifa ukadzimuka fi kada darahim. I believe you when you come to us and give us revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we don't see Allah, we don't see the revelation, we don't know how it comes to you. So if you cannot lie on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why can't I believe you in terms of a few dirhams? So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of this, he said, Shahadati Khuzayma bi shahadati rajulain. In a case where two people are needed to give witness, Khuzayma's witness equaled witness of two people. Why? Because of the faith he had in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of the belief and unflinching belief that he had of what Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told. So we can't say that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not unfair because sometimes we get fairness, we get justice, we get rewarded for what we do. If we don't do like other peoples do, we don't expect to get the rewards, the same thing, they ask the same they get. Brothers and sisters, this title is very, uh, this topic is very long and time does not permit. I would like to end with one misconception that unfortunately is rampant amongst Muslims. Muslims, some Muslims say that because we cannot, the verse says, we cannot be just to our women, so we have to only marry one woman when they talk about polygamy. Actually, uh, polygamy is a misnomer. It's called polygyny. Polygyny is a custom when a man marries more than one wife. And polyandry is a custom whereby a woman is married by two men at the same time. And both of them ca come under polygamy. So polygamy, polygyny, men married more than one wife at the same time. Polyandry, women marrying more than one man at the same time. So when people talk about polygyny, a man having multiple wives, they say, the ayah says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْلِلُوا فِي الْيَتَامَ فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَى فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْلِلُوا فَوَاحِدَى The verse says, if you are afraid that you will not treat the, the, uh, the, orphan, uh, the orphan girls uh, fairly, then you should marry women of your choice, one, two, three, up to four. But if you fear that you, you will not be just and fair, to all the women you have, then you have to marry only one. This is in chapter 4, verse number 3. Then in the same chapter, chapter 4, verse number 129, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You will never ever be able to deal justly with your women. So if you have more than one wife, you can't be just to all of them. So some people say because this verse says we can't at all be just, so we must marry only one. This is a misconception. First, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had more than one wife. And once he came with material things and he distributed them among his wives, then he said, Allahumma hada qasami fi ma amri. Oh Allah, this is my distribution in material things that I possess. Fala tu akhidni fi ma tamlik. Do not, do not condemn me, do not blame me for what you possess which I do not possess, which means the heartfelt inclination. The love is possessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have more than one wife, by nature, your heart will be inclined to one of them. So this does not mean you can't have it. The justice that we are supposed to do is justice in material things. And scholars like uh, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Mas'ud, Mujahid, Al-Hasan al-Basri, they say the second verse that says we cannot be able to do justice to our women, it means three things. You cannot be just with all your women in 
individual love. Of course, you love one more than the other. You cannot be just to them, to them in your carnal desires. Of course, if you have more than one, you will have more desires, uh, you will have carnal appetite to one more than the other, plus uh, conjugal rights. Actually, this is a, this is a, a large topic and I would like to go into details when we have children in this mosque. Just to simplify the matter, the problem with married couples, when you go to suit your would-be bride, and she accepts you during that period of time before you get married you become innovative in doing things in order to strengthen your relationship with her she does the same but once you get each other you get married you get you take it for granted i have her i have him and you don't innovate on ways to love one another so problems start here i was approached by a brother although i kept telling him i am not a counselor i don't have he said, I need advice. I have problems with my wife, and because of that, I want to marry the second wife. I said, what are the problems? He said, I lost appetite for her. You know, before I used to think appetite is for food, I didn't know that appetite can be for other things. So he wanted to go into details. I told him it's haram in Islam to reveal the secrets of your spouse. So keep them secrets. So he alluded, he, yeah, he talked in euphemism. He said, you know, sometimes, uh, he gave me some hints. And I researched the topic. I found that really, really some spouses, they do things which they don't take care of, but these things will lead to losing appetite towards one another, Ex especially if it's a cross-cultural marriage, when you marry from different cultures. So someone does something from his own culture, it's accepted, but from another culture, it's not. So this will pile up, will accrue, until one of the spouses will lose appetite, and if he's a man, he will be, he will be afraid to commit adultery, and he would seek to marry the second wife, and the first wife would be cursing him, complaining, yet she doesn't know, maybe the problem came from her. I won't go through details, but Allah will be in the Quran al-Azim, and I'll be able to give you the ayat of the Fikr al-Hakim, I'll be able to give you the ayat of the Fikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Brothers and sisters in Islam Umar bin Khattab رضي الله عنه was famous for his justice during his time, he made sure that justice prevailed. And he would tell his companions that he fears when a camel stumbles in Iraq, he will be questioned about it. So just imagine he's afraid, a camel stumbling, getting problems, he will be questioned about it. What about Muslims? And because of his justice, he was able to sleep, to be at peace without any problem. There is a delegation that came from Pasha, they wanted to meet with him, and in their minds, they thought they would meet him in a posh palace uh, with uh, expensive items in it. And when they were led to him, they found him sleeping under a tree. They were surprised. What did they say? They said, Hakam fa'adal fa'nimd fa'amind. Which means, because you ruled your people with justice, you were able to have peace that made you able to sleep under a tree. Which means if we observe uh, fairness and justice, we will be successful, we will be happy, and we will, we will be at peace, and we won't have problems. So brothers and sisters in Islam, in your capacity, you have to observe justice, treat people fairly, you will gain in this world and in the hereafter. من الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ورضى اللهم عن أربعة الخلفاء الراشدين أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعن سائر أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجمعين اللهم عز الإسلام وأذل الشيخ والمشركين ودمر أعداءك أعداء الدين 
Allahumma rabba samawati wa rabba al-ard Rabbana wa rabba kulli shay Faliq al-hafi wa al-nawa Wa munzil al-tawrati wa al-injil wa al-furqan Na'udhu bika min shahri kulli shay in anta akhithun min asuyati ya arham al-rahimin Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar Ibad Allah, inna Allah yakbur bil-adu wa al-ihsan wa itaid al-qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wa al-munkar wa al-baghi